Good morning, everyone, and welcome into this very special Earth Week conversation series with Conservation Law Foundation. Now, we're thrilled you can join us this week and hear from these influential women in literature, medicine, religion, and the youth movement who each bring a unique perspective on environmentalism. Now, it will be a wonderful conversation, and we hope you enjoy it. But if you do have any technical issues, our event manager, Katie Ardry, is standing by to help you out. You can contact her directly via email at kardrey at clf.org. That's K-A-R-D-R-E-Y at clf.org. Kitty will take care of everything for you. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to our speakers and enjoy the broadcast. My name is Brad Campbell, president of Conservation Law Foundation. I want to welcome you to this special Earth Day conversation with Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, who is a pastor, environmentalist, and justice advocate activist. Reverend, Reverend Mariama is the founding pastor of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, which is the largest and most diverse neighborhood in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for taking the time from your very busy schedule to join us today. It's good to be here. Let's start with your personal journey. How did you get to where you are today, a spiritual leader pushing for climate and environmental justice? Yeah, so um, I think it, it's sometimes I laugh because this is definitely not what I imagined. <laughs> I thought I was going to be an international human rights lawyer at one point in my life and um, did a lot of work in um, arts and social justice work. Um, I think the turning point for me um, was uh, in 2005, um, I was running a summer program, a young person who was, you know, a part of our program. Um, a real leader, um, he um, just had a commitment to arts and community, and um, we were supposed to be meeting the morning of uh, uh, and the, on my birthday. And that morning, I got a call that he was killed, and um, it, it really uh, became so clear to me how we live in a society um, where we don't value life not nearly at the um, level that we should. And that same summer after dedicating the summer to him, after young people creating things in his memory, um, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. And I remember I was home because we, you know, we'd finished the summer, it was a, t it was a week off and watching um, the scenes of what was happening there and thinking about young people just like Kareem who were already struggling um, with issues of poverty and educational inequity, now living under the effects of um, what the climate crisis is doing in terms of exacerbating every injustice that already exists. Um, and so morning Kareem, looking at the city of New Orleans, a place that I had been quite a bit because we did a civil rights tour, um, I just, felt like um, there is a crisis, um, always has been maybe to some extent, but that we were in a deadline for us as a, as a human society to change. Or Mother Earth was gonna just say, you know what, y'all don't deserve to live here. <laughs> y'all don't deserve um, to, treat, to be here when you treat each other like you do, when you treat um, the oceans, when you treat um, the, the plants that, that create oxygen that allow you to breathe, when you treat um, everything around you with such disdain, I don't know if you can still be here. Um, and so for me, uh, the problem we're facing, science can tell us what is happening and what will happen, but the change we need is a social, a spiritual, a heart change. Um, and so for me, um, my work really lives at the intersection of naming the crisis that we're in, which is not just about parts per million in the atmosphere, but about a way of being that does not value the beautiful, abundant life all around us, each other as human beings, um, and all the non-human, all our non-human relations that, that we rely on to live. Um, and and so my work is, is attempting to help us all uh, recognize this and to make the shift in our souls that is required um, 
to be worthy, to be worthy of continuing to live on this planet, um, to be right with one another. Um, so that, that was my journey. It's a journey I'm still on um, as, a, as a pastor, but also as a farmer. Um, I, I'm part of a, a Black-owned cooperative farm in New Hampshire. Um, lots of different work to move into right relationship and to move into a way of living and being that's sustainable for generations to come that honor the um, sacrifices, particularly my ancestors made for me to even be able to be living and breathing that. Well, Katrina is a reminder that we can't really talk about the climate crisis, racism, economic justice, or human rights as separate issues. Can you talk about mm -hmm. how they, they're connected? Yeah, so I mean, um, it's funny because people say to me like, oh, you do so much stuff. But for me, it all feels very connected. Um, you know, as I was saying, we have embraced a way of being that uses things up and throws things away. And that's not just, you know, fossil fuels. That's how we're treating human beings. My heart was broken to watch a video of a black man assaulting an Asian woman on her way to church. Like, what kind of society um, do we live in um, where we think that's okay? Um, from my perspective, the ancestors are ashamed because of my people have gone through so much. The idea that we would ever think it's okay to turn and do um, that to some other folk or other group. Um, so there's, there's a way of being um, that we need to shift and it plays itself out in who we decide to incarcerate. It plays itself out in where we're investing our money in terms of education. The person who may find the right technology to transform our society, they might be in a school where they're not being given the science skills to actually come up with that. Um, and um, they might not be able to muster the energy to come up with that technology because they don't have enough food to eat. Um, because we live in a, in a nation where we have more than enough food, but people aren't actually getting access to it who need it. So, so for me, all of these things are interconnected. Um, they're not separate. They're about um, the way that we are distributing and uh, using the resources uh, of this planet. And I think, unfortunately, on a daily basis, we are making the wrong decisions. We are prioritizing the wrong things. If we wanna know why people are at our border, because many of them came from ag agricultural communities that have collapsed. They can't make a living on the land that, they're, that generations of their family have, have farmed. So all of these um, things are deeply and intricately connected. And when we try to work on them in ways that forgets those connections, we come up with dumb policies that in exacerbate the situation even more instead of really thinking about how could we um, create a policy that um, thinks about immigration, thinks about um, youth development, thinks about food justice. There are policies out there that allow us to bring that together. Um, there's projects and ways of being in community that would allow us to address multiple challenges at the same time. So when we have narrow thinking, um, I think we, we waste our brain energy, we waste our financial resources um, by tackling all of these things separately instead of acknowledging the connections that definitely exist and thinking about how we find ways to address multiple things at the same time. Well, one of the sources of narrow thinking uh, that you've spoken often about is the fact that you're often the only person of color uh, in traditional environmental circles or when policy making decisions are, are being shaped. Can you talk about the tension between mainstream environmental organizations and environmental justice communities and how we can ease that tension? Yeah. So the truth is that the like ma mainstream environmental movement and, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about you know, the conservation movement, for instance, was led by predominantly upper middle class white folks who were okay with uh, exploiting the land in some places, 
And then let's set aside of some of it to stay pristine in other places, as opposed to um, what a lot of our indigenous um, leaders have said, which is we got to be in right relationship with all of the land. It's not like, oh, well, we'll abuse it over here and then we'll protect it over here, right? That that way of thinking. Um, and so, you know, the, our relationship with the land goes back to the uh, genocide committed against indigenous folks. It goes back to um, my ancestors who were brought here um, to do the labor that other people would benefit from. Um, so I think that um, for me, our history is, is continuing, unfortunately, to play itself out in our current reality. And until we shift that, um, we can't write a new story. The idea that we're going to create a new paradigm, a new reality, using the same ideas and ways of being that got us into this situation, um, to me seems kind of crazy <laughs> and ludicrous. Um, and so, you know, I think um, I see more people acknowledging the shift that we need to make. We still have a long way to go. Um, and so, you know, um, as an example, I've sat in a lot of tables where we're talking about carbon pricing and sort of like, let's just use the, the um, um, modalities of the market to fix this. Now, I'm not saying we can't pay attention to that at all, but sometimes I'm kind of like, how do we uh, root ourselves in a system that's built on exploitation and then try to use that to fix the challenge? Um, and so, you know, I, I think part of the importance of having folks at the table um, is bringing in different voices, bringing in folks who see it from a different perspective. Um, quite frankly, a lot of times we see it from the perspective of the, of the people that have been left out or the people whose labor and, and live, life has been used <laughs> to sort of prop up the system that that is. Um, needing to have some real challenging conversations. For instance, I'm all for electrification. I think that we, we need to electrify our system. But what I'm not for is continuing to cite all of those electrification facilities in EJ communities. I want the suburban folks who are out there signing petitions for electrification to start citing some of those uh, 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 new facilities in their communities. Because I trust that we're gonna be serious about safety in those in these new facilities if they're down the street from the governor. I trust that we're gonna be serious about making them as clean and as healthy as possible when the CEO of, of Instar drives past those electrification facilities. Um, the burdens cannot always be on the same groups every time. Um, and so I, I see that kind of thing where people are advocating for, for a shift and not asking who is going to be asked to bear the burdens. And unfortunately, again and again, it's the same communities being asked to bear the burden. Communities like East Boston and Weymouth, um, where you have collections of facilities where people are living under so much pollution. Um, and so, We've got to change that. If we're gonna live and move to a radical new reality, that also means distributing the burden differently. So everybody has some skin in the game to make sure um, that what we're doing is uh, meeting the highest standards of, of, of safety. CLF advocacy is focused on environmental challenges in New England as a region, understanding that what happens at the city, state, and regional level has to be a catalyst for what happens nationally or even globally. Mm -hmm. uh, locally, we have a new mayor at the helm in Boston who's made history as the first woman and the first person of color to hold the mayor's seat. And I'm wondering, what would you urge uh, the new mayor in terms of uh, what her priorities should be for Boston and, and how Boston can lead uh, the rest of New England and the country uh, on climate justice. Yeah, so um, I am actually engaged in a co-chair of her climate and transportation justice um, um, committee. Uh, and I, I applaud what she actually did just yesterday in terms of naming um, that the cuts at the uh, public transportation that the MBTA is proposing are going to hurt our most vulnerable folks. Those folks that 
have continued to go out and put their lives on the line to go bag groceries, those folks who continue to um, push their way through to deliver packages, um, those are folks who need our public transportation system and making a cut at this time um, only makes folks' lives more challenging. It also means that on the other side of this, when people actually start feeling comfortable taking public transportation, their likelihood to do so will be lower because the quality of that public transportation um, will not be what it should be. So I applaud her in sort of naming these kinds of challenges. Um, and I think, you know, we've got to have a conversation with our governor who um, I think, uh, stepped in and said he really wanted to take this on as an issue that um, he cares about. Um, I know there's a lot going on in COVID, but we can't see our public transportation gutted um, because of this crisis and put us in a position where more and more people are going to be driving or just not able to get to the places um, that they need to. So I think, um, you know, the other big piece, um, and you know, I, this is in the report that we're sitting to her is that, uh, um, too often, Boston, like many other places, has had a climate agenda that's over here and not deeply interconnected with the housing agenda and um, the open space agenda. And there's been some shift. I think um, uh, Chris Cook, who's who's in charge of open space, but also now environment and energy, um, has done a good job of beginning to create some, some cross-cutting conversations. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done. Um, we know where B Boston is climate vulnerable and the idea that we are actively building housing <laughs> in some of those places, that the city is siting um, new facilities in places that we know are gonna flood, doesn't make a lot of sense. It seems like we're setting people up to be climate vulnerable. And so again, it's about not having our climate policy over here and then our other policies over here in a way that those two things are not interconnecting. As we've already talked about, that's how you get to bad policy. Not recognizing those connections means that you make decisions in a vacuum that you're gonna have to go back and correct later. Um, so I, um, I'm hoping and ho and hopeful that the that the new mayor will look at this. Um, she's got ten months in office. Her biggest push is going to need to be really bringing us back from COVID. So I think you know that's that's um, a priority. We've asked her to look at um, specifically heat um, and heat exposure, particularly this summer, as people are starting to feel comfortable coming back out. But not everybody will. And we don't want our people in their houses literally um, dying from heat. Um, and so we've been uh, trying to put together some innovative strategies that uh, are COVID safe and allow us to protect particularly um, some of our seniors and our, uh, our, our little ones who are particularly unable to regulate their own body temperature. Um, and we need to absolutely be sure um, that they are, that are safe. And that's, you know, that's an example of something where um, we've talked a lot about sea level rise and I think that is absolutely important, but more people are actually dying from heat in many instances. And I think that because often those folks are more low income, more people of color. Um, that has not been as prevalent of an issue within the climate movement as it needs to be. But I hope that um, our new mayor will see the opportunity to uh, address this as both a COVID recovery issue and a climate justice issue um, as we try to become a more resilient city. Heat and other climate impacts are, you know, more often than not, the most lethal in neighborhoods that are uh, historically redlined. And you mm -hmm. grew up in Dorchester, it's where your church is. That's a historically redlined neighborhood that's now being gentrified, which is another one of those disconnects between transportation policy on the one hand and, and housing policy on the, on the other, because as transportation improves, the gentrification pressures begin. What's been the impact of gentrification in your neighborhood? Yeah, so. I do want to give a shout out. I do live in Dorchester, but I also did grow up in Roxbury. So I don't want to have my Roxbury people not uh, say that I claim my neighborhood. So yeah, um, but uh, I actually really grew up through, close to the Roxbury Dorchester line. But anyway, um, yeah, I I think 
you know, it's been interesting because many of the, the um, houses in our neighborhood didn't have central air. Now they're being condoed and, um, and as the condos come in line, they have central air. So it's, you know, there's, there's an inequity in terms of people who are living in the older housing stock, stock in the neighborhood and people are living in this sort of newer, fancier, often, you know, luxury apartments uh, and condos that are being built. Um, so I think, you know, our neighborhood really is um, a microcosm of what's going on, not just in the city and, and the state, but really in um, in the country. We are the third most diverse zip code uh, that I live in 02125 in America. Um, we have a um, large Black, Latino, uh, Asian, and white communities. Um, and um, we've been in conversation, for instance, with the work that Viet Aid is trying to do to bring in the Vietnamese community to deeper into this conversation. How do we um, mobilize more of the Cape Verdean um, community to be engaged in this conversation? Because um, those are folks that are very deeply impacted, but often not at the table when the conversations are, are happening around what we need to be doing. How do we get more of our seniors in? How do we actually, I think climate is an amazing issue to build intergenerational um, relationships between young people who are often more aware of the issue and seniors who um, can be part of the connection and can actually have seen the evolution of how things are shifting and changing um, if if they're engaged in those conversations one with another. So I think, um, you know, it is a big question for us. Will folks rise up and shift and organize in our neighborhood to make it better and then find themselves pushed out? That is exactly what I experienced as a kid in Roxbury. Many people did a ton of work around um, dealing with issues of violence and and beautifying our communities and our neighborhoods only to find themselves unable to afford to continue living in the neighborhood. Um, and so I think, you know, I am hoping, and again, you know, having this conversation with Viet Aid and groups like Dorchester Not For Sale um, and Asian American Resource Workshop, how are we thinking about displacement, both the displacement that's happening right now in terms of gentrification and that climate will exacerbate that gentrification um, by making more of our neighborhood unstable. Um, and so uh, again, how do we come together and imagine policies that allow us to work on multiple issues at the same time? How do we make sure that people who want to stay in our neighborhood can stay? I don't think there's anything wrong with new people coming into the neighborhood. It's just when um, the new people coming are literally displacing people that want to stay, but can't. Um, so, um, I, you know, there's, I, I had a conversation with Mike Skokal, who was one of the folks that runs our um, Columbia Savin Hill Neighborhood Association. Um, he's one of the folks that's like, how do we bring this conversation into the Neighborhood Association? We're actually having a convening next week with a bunch of different groups in Dorchester to sort of say, is there a different way we could be approaching this that's more collaborative and that builds community? Because the reality is our neighborhood, in addition to being, we are the largest neighborhood in, in Boston. Um, we are the third, if we were a city by ourselves, we'd be the third largest in the state. <laughs> um, we're pretty large. Um, my my uh, farm in New Hampshire is down the road from Concord and, we, and Dorchester by itself is three times the size of Concord. Um, we're like a fifth the size of the entire state of Vermont. So we're we're a pretty big neighborhood. Um, and, and I think that gives us the opportunity to lead, not just for ourselves. We do need it for ourselves. We need it. We need to be not a neighborhood of of sub neighborhoods, we need to be a neighborhood that is united, um, that that people are in um, good relationship with each other. Um, we need to be a neighborhood where um, some of our residents, particularly some of our white residents, are not threatened by the idea that um, Fields Corner, um, the, there was an idea to uh, name it Little Saigon as a cultural district. And there were some people who were like upset about that. I was like, bring it on. I want to tell people I live um, down the street from a Vietnamese cultural district. We don't have to be threatened by each other. We could be excited to name how amazing and how culturally diverse our neighborhood is and how we together 
um, are making sure that all our folks can afford to stay and that we are protected um, and, and working together because, uh, you know, we are right in the ocean. Uh, we are right there. Carson Beach um, is in our neighborhood, you know, uh, Naponza area, you know, we've got a lot of water going on over there. Um, and so that that's my hope. That's my prayer. That's my dream. Um, and I am excited because I live with such amazing neighbors. And um, I think it is a dream that is not only my own, but one that I hope we can share and, and cultivate. As, as uh, focused as you've been on these challenges at the neighborhood level, you've also been eloquent about uh, the need to protect natural resources and uh, most recently the need to re re restore the protections of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, which is off the coast of New England. Why is it so important to reinstate protections for the marine monument and to protect uh, those resources generally? And, and how do we shift the narrative around these issues so it doesn't, we're not pitting environmentalists against uh, fishing communities uh, and heightening the tension between those two sides of the issue? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, um, I just got back from uh, a scuba diving trip for a week. I love scuba, it's like, where all my disposable income goes to <laughs> scuba diving. Um, and I actually was diving on the um, sea mount in Cachinos Cayos, in uh, Cayos Cuchinos in, um, in Honduras. Um, sea mounts are beautiful um, spaces that allow sort of sets of nutrients and plants and therefore, you know, animal life to flourish. That's just, um, it creates the right conditions for life to be abundant. And that abundance can overflow to everywhere around. But if you choke that abundance, that will also flow to everywhere around. And so the importance of the monument and the, and the seamount is to really protect a place where life is abundant so that all everywhere else can also be abundant. Um, and so, you know, we know, I, I do believe that fishing communities um, care about the health of the ocean. They know that their livelihoods depend on it. Um, I also think uh, we do have documented sort of history that um, if we don't protect certain places, um, accidents happen. Um, People, bad actors, <laughs> you know, folks who are not following the rules um, are not held accountable. Um, and so um, we, um, it, is, it is worth it to save some places. There are some places that are just particularly special and they, they um, need to be recognized for what they are. Um, I think we can do it in a way um, that also protects fishing communities. Um, and I think my challenge is I also identify with fishing communities in the same, experiencing the support of environmental communities the same way that EJ groups do. You support us when we come up to show, but then you're not necessarily with us when we're dealing with the like very real economic issues because those, those look like not that environmental. Right. Um, so I, I think part of it is the environmental community has got to take environment and economy together. Eco uh, means home and economy means management of home. If we don't shift the way we are managing our home and our resources so that everyone can do well, then we don't really care at the level that we should about saving our home about protecting our home. Um, so I, I, I think there are ways in which some people are asked to sacrifice their livelihoods in ways that just don't make sense. Um, and particularly want to pay attention to how are we supporting smaller fishing operations and communities. I'm not that worried about, you know, the, the big guys. They'll be okay, they'll be okay. But there are smaller um, operations that are vulnerable, and we need to name and acknowledge that that is true. Um, one of the things I think is like kind of exciting. I've been looking at um, 
some of these um, uh, fish uh, or sea farming operations? Like, is that something that could become more real? Could we create opportunities for people to be doing um, multi-layered farming operations in the sea? Can we give people um, access to capital to begin experimenting with that? Like, how are we really paying attention to what it will take um, to make sure that everyone can thrive? There is a solution in which everyone thrives, or at least thrives to what they need. Now, there are people that have been used to thriving far beyond what they need. Um, and far too often, we don't address those folks, but we ask sacrifice of people who are living close to the margins. Um, and um, we've got to change the way we do policy so that um, we're really taking into account the thriving of the oceans, the thriving of um, our sea life, and the thriving of our um, communities that have had a long-term relationship with the ocean for their livelihood. A big factor in addressing those issues has been the emergence of a, a powerful youth uh, cohort, uh, both on climate justice and across a range of issues. You started your activism very young, uh, mm -hmm. including the boycott of Coca-Cola in support of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Can you speak a little bit to the role of, of youth in the climate justice movement and, and how you see that uh, as a strength? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that young people have elevated climate onto the agenda in a way that I think we would never have gotten to without their activism. It's absolutely true. Um, and I'm thankful for them speaking up, um, standing out, pushing, because it was absolutely needed. Here's what I think we now need. Um, I get a little concerned that sometimes everybody's like, go young people, you'll figure it out. And it's like, no, <laughs> we actually, need, this is a all hands on deck. So I am thankful that young people have elevated this. But what they've asked is that some of us who are not so young get off our butts and do something about it. And so what I'm hoping for is, um, that we will be bolstered by the activism of young people, but that we actually start creating more intergenerational spaces of, um, of courage, of creativity, um, it's that will push the envelope, that, that start creating the solutions that are needed. Because I'm a little concerned that some of our mentality is, yeah, yeah, good thing there's those great young people at the forefront, Let's keep doing close to nothing and then asking them to bear an even greater burden than they're already um, set up for. So I, I applaud young people and I wanna challenge those of us who are a little bit older. It's not just about celebrating their activism, it's actually responding to what they've asked for, which is for us to rise up and do something different. Um, and I think we need to do that with young people because I think they will bring the kind of energy and the kind of courage and the, um, the, the creativity and innovation to help us address it. But it should not um, be celebrating them while remaining in the same place <laughs> we've already been. As a spiritual leader, you provide inspiration and hope to people at, at times that are, are really trying. And uh, with COVID, uh, the murders of Black people at the hands of police, the insurrection of the Capitol, all of that's put a glaring spotlight on the racism and, inequi and, and inequity that have been known really for generations. How do we uh, maintain hope in the face of uh, that backdrop? And, and what do you see us uh, needing to do so that we don't go back to business as usual uh, as the pandemic fades? Yeah. So I, you know, I, um, the first thing that I say is I um, would be disappointed, utterly floored if we think it is okay to go back to who we were. Going back to what was normal before is absolutely unacceptable. It would constitute failure. I think that the, that's the first thing we have to name 
is we need to resolve never to go back because COVID has um, exposed things that were already there and already problematic. It has actually made us sit down and pay attention to some things that we hadn't. Yes, what Derek Chauvin did was particularly egregious, but it's not like we weren't having a problem with police brutality before um, this happened. That it, it wasn't an aberration, it was just um, uh, one of the uh, sort of extreme uh, events. But right now we're experiencing attacks against Asian Americans. We've got a problem with violence. We've got a problem with violence. We've got a problem with racism in this country um, that we've had a really long time. And I can't imagine a better time to take it seriously, to transform and never go back. We've lost half a million of our neighbors, our grandparents, our friends. We've lost them. And um, I think the best way we honor their memory is to transform ourselves into a country where this, what has happened to us over the last year would not happen to us again. Um, so I think the first thing is to be um, utterly uh, dissatisfied with the status quo. I think the next piece of it will require, again, um, you, you hear me talking about creativity. There are some things we need to do and place ways we need to imagine that don't currently exist. And we need to be creative and courageous enough to start building those new institutions, start building those new communities, start weaving new networks of people um, that are going to take uh, care of and responsibility for each other. Um, so I think uh, that is a combination of organizations rethinking how they do things. That's every one of us sitting down and saying, what are, thi what are ways that I know that I've grown in this pandemic, things that I'm doing better, that I am not going to lose when I have the option to go back to the other way of being? And um, when we can be together, how are we going to love each other like we never have before? Um, my mom, they, she got her second a vaccine shot and I was part of the vaccine study. So I've actually been vaccinated since October. And um, she told me, she said, on Wednesday, I, I wanna see you and I, and I can give you a hug <laughs> because she will have had her vaccine you know, long enough. Um, there are things we lost in this pandemic that we didn't value before, and we need to lean into them um, like never before. And um, some of us didn't know we were gonna make it through this, and we have. So I just say we like move with reckless abandon to pursue the things we hope and dream for, the kind of work of justice. Um, I spent, a good chunk of my time last year working on a police reform bill. It doesn't have everything I want, but it pushed Massachusetts forward. Um, and we still need to continue the conversation because I think there were some folks in the law enforcement community that were um, open and a lot that were pretty closed. Um, so the conversation needs to keep pushing. Um, we need to start saying things like, if the police are not good at dealing with folks who have mental health, why are we still letting them do that? What are the alternate systems that we need to help people who have mental health challenges to get the support they need? We have enough data to know locking them up is like not working. It's literally killing people in some instances. So let's start imagining creating and funding new systems that actually help protect people and help them to get well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that um, this crisis helps unstick us from the status quo, I can't tell you how much in my counseling, people, you know, well, this is how we are, or, but is this who you want to be? 
Is this who you're called to be? Because if not, let's take this as a data point of where you are and start imagining where we need to be going. And you're not gonna get there overnight. You can't just decide that you wanna be someone different and wake up tomorrow. There's hard work involved. There will be two steps forward and, and one step back. That's totally true. But there's no time like the present to get started on that journey. Um, and I think that's true for individuals. I think it's also very much true for our society. Um, and I'm so I'm excited about um, the possibilities of creating um, new systems and walking into something new. Well, on that inspiring note, I want to thank you, Reverend Mariama, for sitting down with us today. I really want to thank you more for your creative and courageous leadership uh, and I urge you to call us out as an organization when we can help support that leadership. So thank you, uh, Reverend Mariama. Thanks to all of you who've joined us today. And uh, we will continue to uh, look forward to working with you uh, on the many challenges we covered today. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to CLF's special Earth Week conversation series. Now, we're thrilled to be celebrating the 51st Earth Day with you. If you missed any of the conversations from earlier this week, you can view them again on CLF's YouTube player right on this page. And remember, the conversation does not end here. Sign up for CLF's e-news by going to clf.org so you can stay informed and take action. You can also support CLF by donating just below this video player. A gift at any level drives our work throughout New England forward. Thank you so very much and happy Earth Day.